It's a great honor to give a server-side session at this year's Techverse 2022. Our topic is about server architecture behind the safety check at the line. Today's session will be delivered by my colleague Alfredo and I. Could you introduce yourself, Alfredo? Hey, thank you for attending today's session. My name is Alfredo Sorio. I'm a server-side software engineer at CSI DevBT. Thank you. Thank you. As another speaker, my name is Zhixin Li. I work in CSI Dev A team as a server-side engineer. This is today's agenda. We have five sections. First, safety check feature is introduced. I'd like to demonstrate with some examples about UI. User can, use, can see in this feature, secondly, disaster management and notification architecture. Uh, we start from the disaster management system and then we move on to the next core part, the event-driven architecture of update API. Finally, how we did the law test for this high traffic system and then make a summary for this session. I will cover the first two points and then pass to Alfredo of the rest. Safety Check was launched on the Line app earlier this year. It provides an easy way to report safety status to a Line friends or check the status of your friends during the disasters like earthquakes. I will give an example of how this feature works during a disaster. As you can see here, when there is a disaster in user's area, a red banner is displayed on the Line homepage. You can select learn more to see the details on the news or view report your status to go to a page where you can input your own statuses. You can get to this page after clicking report your status. In addition to setting your status as I'm safe or I'm affected, you can also enter additional message from either a list of preset messages or typing by yourself here. After clicking save, you will share the status and your message to your friends. You can also view friend status on the main service page. It's quick and easy to check the status of your friends and vice versa. So uh, why are we implementing this feature for our users? Safety check prevents communication from being paralyzed. This feature will also minimize the battery and data consumption by just a few clicks to report your status. After a disaster, the communication is not stable enough. And what is worse is that when more people use it, it's more stable. And also, you can quickly confirm about your friend's information using this feature. All these advantages give user a peace of mind in the event of the disaster. This is the goal of our feature. And you must be curious about how we implement the back end. Let's start with disaster management first. This is the common case when we decide to enable this feature for our users. So when uh, the disaster occurs, such as a earthquake, one of our teams, a URL the planning team, will discuss whether to enable the feature based on the level of the disaster and also the affected areas. If the answer is yes, our operator will register disasters using our content management system, CMS, which allows adding new disasters to the database. We also use the CMS to enable the disasters and send notifications to our target users. After this action, a banner will be displayed to the target user. As you can see here, the CMS types decisions to the end result. This should be a pretty cool feature, at least from a disaster management perspective. Let's look at the architecture of our CMS. This is the architecture you can see for the CMS. In the middle, we have two servers, the safety check CMS server, and on the right, safety check server. The safety check CMS server serves the web services for internal operator. 
It also controls connections to the database and the notification service. On the other hand, Safety Check Server is an external API server. It returns response about the disaster information from the request of the users via the API gateway. Let's talk the details in this architecture one by one. The right part is about the CMS itself. As I said before, it's short for the content management system. It allows easy management of server metadata, uh, service metadata on the front end, such as information and other configurations for this feature. It has web HTTP service with authentication. Of course, we need to management to management the permission of the like, like added read only for the operator. Uh, so there is a permission management feature. At the back end, we use the REST API implemented by Armeria. Armeria is a commonly used platform for line server-side implementation. I think some other companies also use Armeria for their services. For the CMS, our internal service, we have three pages, which are disaster case, uh, message template and also not notification service. And uh, here are some uh, screenshots on the right. We have a uh, quite standard UI design because it's only for the internal usage. The disaster case and the message template define something like earthquake name, the description, and also the detail URL in different languages. The message template defined um, the preset template that user can choose as a, a message in the different languages. And next, notification service. The notification service is an internal lightweighted uh, event delivery system for Line. The model is quite simple. When there is uh, some change in the CMS, like update, delete, uh, like disable or enable a disaster, a signal will send to the client side. After receiving the signal, iOS or Android uh, will request the server uh, contents by the pointed API. After receiving this uh, signal, the client requests the safety check server, which uh, uh, in this case is get disaster cases, and the server responds uh, the data. The client will know the latest disaster cases. You can also set the filter for our uh, user client, like which version you want to send or which regions, which de device type, iOS or Android. Uh, we can also define the delay time to control the server traffic. OK, uh, let's move uh, to the next part of the safety check, the database. As you can see, the safety check DB will be read by the safety check server and uh, read and write by the CMS server. It's uh, quite simple. It's implemented using the MongoDB as the primary database. Since there is not, uh, not many relational things in the model, we just use this uh, quite simple structure and defines the multiple data, which is a disaster, disaster cases in the MongoDB. And here is the server API part. The server API to get disaster cases uh, is defined in Swift. It's also a quite common protocol between the server and the client side. Uh, server get users country and language with API request as the parameter of the API. In the following Swift, the response has a list of disaster info, which is the disasters, a list of string in the local, local language, which is the message template, and also a timestamp that I will introduce it next. Uh, we have client local DB and also a server side cache. Uh, as you can see, the server has a local memory cache to reduce the DB request. The reason is that uh, disaster case do not change frequently. Basically, after registering it, it won't change until it is closed, or I mean it's disabled the feature for the, for the, for the feature. And the data actually are the same for all users in the same country and language. So the normal flow is that the client requests the safety check server 
each safety check server will use the uh, cache directly based on the language and the locale to give the response. Uh, there is no DB request for every client request. And the request for the cache itself is updated asynchronously every fixed time. For example, here, uh, we update like every one minute. So actually, the DB request is quite low. Uh, even here, the API request is very high. Next is the client-side cache. You may know the iOS, Android uh, keep their local DB for disaster cases. So every time they request a server API, uh, they will save all disaster cases in the local DB. And every time user opens line, clients will check whether there, is, uh, there are active disaster cases in local DB. If it has a red banner and also other feature UI will show for the client side. When we want to disable this feature, we need to uh, change the status to disable uh, in the CMS and then send another notification to the users. After receiving that, the feature should be turned off for the target users. But in rare cases, uh, the banner will keep showing for users when notification is delayed or lost. In, uh, so this is what we don't want to see for the user, since user cannot actually report their status uh, due to uh, there's actually no um, disaster. It is important to keep this cache up to date. And it's also not good if the client keep requesting the server. Uh, there will be a traffic issue for the server. To resolve such problems, we add some strategies for the client-side cache. We have uh, two strategies. One, client will request this get disaster case API when user access the end page of the safety check. So every time the user uh, click report my statuses, even there's no the notification signal, the client will still request the latest uh, disaster case. So this will ensure every time user gets the latest data. And also there is a TTL stamp in the API response, uh, I, as I introduced before. Client will request the API when the TTL expires. So even user do nothing about this feature itself, the client iOS Android still updates their local DB when the TTL expires. So these two things make sure that the client will have the kind of latest data for the disaster cases. OK, that's all I want to share. And I think I will pass to Alfredo for the next part. Hi, uh, th thank you, Shikin san, for your part. So now let's move on to the next part. So the next part of the agenda is event driven architecture for updates, load testing, and the summary. Okay, so event driven architecture for updates. For this, we have what is called the public subscribe model. On, in which you have the producer, a broker, and a consumer. Basically, the producer writes messages into the broker, and the consumer reads those messages from the broker. This has advantages over the normal request response model in that the producer and the consumer are loosely decoupled. That means that if you need to add more consumers who are interested in reading those messages, the producer doesn't need to change and doesn't need to know about these changes. Okay, so in Kafka, we use, uh, for the broker, we use within Kafka. Uh, and in line, we use Decaton. Decaton is a library for a stream trust processing framework built on top of Kafka developed by line. So, in Kafka, when you want to read messages from a topic, you use what is called the consumer API. This basically works by reading messages from partitions. So for example, if you have 10 consumers, 
and 10 partitions, those consumers will get assigned a partition to read from. And whenever the consumer reads from this partition, like you will have like the 10, the 10 consumers reading from those partitions at the same time. But if you wanted to add more concurrency, you will need to add more partitions and add more consumers as well. Sometimes this is not possible. So this is when Decathlon becomes useful because it removes this limitation and you can read, multiple clients can read from the same partitions. This is open source, so you can take a look at the GitHub repository. So now let's move on to safety check update architecture. In the safety check of the architecture, we have, in, on the left side, you can see that we have user A, who is friends with user B and user C. And as explained before, uh, each of these applications have their own local DB. So when user A wants to update its status, it makes a request for the update sta safety status endpoint and goes through the API gateway, and then it reaches the safety check server, which also uses the microservice uh, library called Armeria that was explained before. Then the safety check server validates the disaster, for example, uh, puts that message into a topic, and then we have other instances running the safety check Decathlon library that I talked about before, process that message and finds the target users for that source user. So it starts putting those messages into another topic with this format, like the source user, target user, disaster ID, status, and message. Then there is a notification service who reads those messages and sends those notifications to user B and user C. And then each of these users automatically, uh, the, the application updates the status so that they have the latest update from user A. So when they check the status from user for user A, they will see the most reflected uh, value. Now let's move on to load testing. For load testing, uh, we did what we call mocking services. So let me explain first. So when you are doing testing, you usually have some dependencies like this. You are testing your application and has uh, dependencies to microservice A and microservice B. And it, you communicate via HTTP. So with mock server, you can replace those dependencies and it will look like this. And the benefits of doing that is that you can scale out depending on your needs. Since you don't need the real service, you can create as many replicas for your load test. So you can guarantee the service latency. Also, you can avoid red limits, like some services have this limitation. So if you're doing low testing, like most probably you would reach that limit. So you don't have to worry about that. Also, avoid avoids modifying the real state. You can tune your mocks as you need. So you can test edge cases, test error scenarios, and the results are deterministic. It's mainly useful for your integration tests and low tests. Now let's move on to the next topic, which is like a Spring Cloud Contract. A Spring Cloud Contract is a tool that enables consumer-driven contract development. It consists of two components, the Spring Cloud Contract Verifier plugin, which is a plugin that is supported by Gradle and Maven, and also the Spring Cloud Contract Stop Runner, which is basically the mock server. Okay, so now let me show you how you would configure the Spring Cloud Contract in your project. Here you can see that uh, we want to mock the microservice talk server. And the talk server microservice has like 
HTTP endpoints and trip endpoints. And each of those endpoints that you want to mock has their own file in which you specify the, the contract, which means the mock that you want. Then you have your build.gradle. The contract will look like this. And basically, in the contract, you specify, like, if you get this request, I want this response. So here we can see that the, we are defining that if we get a request with the method post and a URL defined and this body, then I want you to return this response with this status and these headers. Okay, now uh, the project build.gradle build looks like this. You, you define the Spring Cloud Contract plugin, as I explained before, the uh, dependency, the directory where you store your contracts, and where you want to publish your artifact. I'm going to talk more about that in, in this overview. So basically, what I just said is you define your contracts using a DSL that is provided by Spring Cloud Contract in Kotlin, Java, or YAML, you can choose. Then, with the plugin, we'll create the artifact with your mocks, and you would publish that into Nexus repository. Then, in order to run your mock server, you need to define the number of replicas that you want to have, the stops, the server port of your mock server, and the Kubernetes service. And then, when you run the, stop, the, the mock server, the mock server, based on that configuration, would fetch from the Nexus repository the mocks that you need. So this is the Kubernetes configuration. We have the replicas. We have the image, a Spring Cloud contract. Uh, the, the port of the mock server and the stops that you want to run. And also the service so that you can make the mock server accessible. Now let's move on to load testing tool. So for load testing, we are using IAPERF. IAPERF is a line developed tool for distributed load testing based on locus. The advantage that it has over normal IAPERF is that it allows you to define your test using Java. This is not possible with, uh, with Locus. And also, it allows you to be a, a common tool to set up the necessary worker nodes so that you can generate the, the load for your load testing. And also, you can visualize the metrics in Grafana. So this is how it looks like. You have the Kubernetes cluster in which you have the locus master and the workers. The workers uh, communicate with the locus master to be able to coordinate and see like the necessary load that they need to reach. And then they start sending the request to the application, also called the system under test. Okay. So this is the load test definition. You have the test name, uh, also the type, as I explained before, we are using trip, and the actual implementation code of the, the request. In this case, we are testing the update safety status request. So we define the disaster ID, the message, the status, and finally we make the request. And the load test definition works by defining the number of instances that you want and also how many requests per seconds you want to have per each instance and the command line to run your application. Okay, so this is a load test architecture. You have on the left side what I just explained. And on the right side, you have your application running behind a load balancer. So the safety check server is deployed with as many pods that you want. Then uh, the 
mock server, in this case, uh, the Spring Cloud contract deployment is used to mock the, the dependencies that the safety check server has. Okay, now let's move on to load testing results. So here we have two APIs, the update safety status API, which we calculated to have 10,000 RPS, which represents a 47.61 ratio. And then we have the get disaster cases with 11,000 RPS. And in total, it's 22,000 RPS. So first of all, to load test, you usually start to test like individually. In this case, uh, we are testing the update safety status. So we did this test with this spec, uh, uh, one virtual machine, uh, eight virtual CPUs, 16, 16 gigabyte RAM. So we did different tests, like from 1,000 RPS, as, as I said before, RPS is request per second, up to 2,400 RPS. So as expected, uh, of course, as we increase the RPS, the CPU usage increases as well. So the point here is that you need to check like what would be the optimal uh, scenario that your application can withstand. So you are trying to find the best latency according to the RPS. We did the same for the get disaster cases, and we run different tests, and you can see the CPU utilization, and then on the right, the, the response times in percentiles. So in other words, the latency. So finally, uh, we did similar tests, but instead of testing like individually, so we have both of these APIs in one server. That means that in order to mimic the real scenario, we would like to test both APIs at the same time. So the RPS that we decided that would be optimal was 1,600 RPS. So update safety status and get disaster cases. So with this scenario, you can see that we have uh, update safety status running with 700 60 RPS and get disaster cases for 840 RPS. Uh, the CPU utilization is 30% and the response percentiles were very, very good. So given that a single server is able to handle about 1,600 RPS with about 30% CPU, then 14 servers were enough to support our initial estimation of 22,000 RPS. So now let's move on to the summary. So robust CMS allows easy configuration and fast distribution. Cache strategies increase traffic tolerance and keep client up to date. Event-driven architecture decouples your microservices, and the Caton allows you to achieve higher throughput with small number of partitions. And mocking server helps you control the test scenarios and the service latency. And finally, load testing allows to measure application throughput and resource utilization. So that's pretty much it from my side, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Osorio-san, Lee-san, from now I'd like to just and I'd like to just get into the deep dive the sessions and so we'd like to open the flow from the question as much as possible so that we'd like to make it interactively. Do you have any question? Would you please just hit that the question button and the right side right bottom part of the screen so that you can post the questions. So that's the, the questioner is that the Yahoo Japan, Mr. Junya Masuda, Yahoo Japan, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm 
And I'm working on the engineering of the backend side of this disaster application too. And the Junya Matsuda of Yahoo Japan. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Matsuda. So just the first off, what did you what what uh, interested you the most? And the first of all, two of them, you are uh, making very very interesting and informative presentation. Thank you very much. My question is that actually uh, in the page twelve in the slide. And actually, we have the disaster and breakout, and then, for example, and then you are, uh, no, you just have a discussion internally in the line, and that you determine to and send the notice, and the banner will be displayed. That this is that the basic process, right? So, in this is in the process, and for this, we are this disaster teams that and also uh, we are passed on that information onto the line, so that, for example, if you can have some kind of the process we can just automate all this process it might be also possible have you ever tried to just discuss about that the possibility of automation of this process thank you for your question uh actually currently to enable this feature for one region we still need to manual operations like an operator at least to register uh input the disaster information to the system using SAMAS. but actually uh, in the future we are thinking to connect with like Yahoo Japan API or Line News to get the disaster case automatically and we use logic to register it uh, to the system and auto open that. So that is possible and I think uh, I think we have planned to do that. But currently still uh, we have some co human cost for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for answer. Yes, I understand that. So, yeah, we'd like to work more closely with the line so that we can provide that to the better and that disaster related and an applications as much as possible. And I'd like to do our utmost. So thank you very much for your cooperation. My next question is that when it comes to so this is the safety check and. Now, in this question of banner for the notifying that they said safety check. So in a peacetime, and peacetime, so there's no request will be sent in the peacetime. So that's you no know, this the server will be idling. But actually, once that and the big disaster series disaster that comes out and that will mean that the tons are really just a surge of the spike of the traffic we have to handle. So once you just have to accept that kind of a surge of at the time of that this uh, you have to keep the availability of the systems. So is there any specific and the system mechanism or points you uh, you 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 care about uh, how you how you can deal with that kind of a spike of traffic at the time of emergency? He will answer that question. So for now, right now, like as I explained before, like uh, we did some estimation about how many RPS we would get. So we prepare beforehand according to to those numbers. So right now, like we have those servers, and when there is a disaster, like they will get those requests and start to. Uh, respond accordingly. So in the next phase, we are planning to have this automatically, like auto-scaling, so that if, for example, if there is a big disaster that exceeds these uh, numbers that we estimated before, then we can easily add more instances automatically. So yes, this is also uh, another part we are planning to improve. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, and if it's all the scaling, it become available. It will really a wonderful solution. So that uh, I myself, so I'm an as an engineer, that just that I, yeah, I didn't think about it. But uh, yes, if it, the auto scaling is available and it's really just uh, uh, making that an order the system or the efficiency and also, and uh, I don't want to think about an image about that kind of a serious disaster. But anyway. Just in the case, and we have to deal with it. Just be and just be on the safe side. Okay, thank you very much. This will be the last question. When I'm reading all these slides, this will be the last question. The all the service architectures seemed very simple. 
because you have a simple structure, it's easy to manage it and easy, easy to use it. That's my impression. To have a structure, structure, do you have anything you devise uh, in mind? Do you have anything you something do something special in order to have a simple structure? Um, so I think for this uh, architecture, since it's only for the single aim, just for the uh, safety check, so the the system seems very uh, not that complex. That's uh, normal, and as my part, at least for the measurement part, we use a lot of the I mean traditional technology. We already apply to other uh, services in the home tab, including the thrift thrift between the client and the server API, and also MongoDB uh, is also one of our primary database. Uh, as as also the REST API between the CMS. So I can see for my part, the system is quite. Uh, are common, and but at the beginning we need to think carefully about the data model and how we put the data and how we design the CMS API to allow the operations and also consider the permission. I think that's uh, uh, what I want to say uh, in my in my part. And do you have any ideas, Fredo, for your side? Yes. Uh, so from my side, like I think that uh, as I explained before, like uh, people are familiar with Kafka. And they think that the only way to scale is only by adding more partitions and more instances. But uh, this is not the case. Uh, when I joined Line, I was very uh, shocked to see that there were other options, such as using the Decathlon library, which allows you to uh, scale uh, using a small number of partitions. So yes, uh, this is very useful in cases where you don't need to do mm, so much transformations in your data. Because like there are other solutions uh, that may not apply. For example, if you're transforming your data uh, in, in your events, there are other solutions of such as Kafka Streams. So depending on your case, uh, it's useful to evaluate all the solutions. Thank you very much for answering your questions. You have experience and you have think of many things. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have to say. But we have. But this will be the last last question because we have some time left. Two of you, when you continue uh, developing a service. What is the uh, motivation behind you, behind the developing this work? What motivates you best to develop this scheme? Uh, so for me, I think the first working line is quite a great experience. And actually, I just feel happy to implement some uh, features for users. I'll say that. Um, programming and testing or design the architecture, discussing together with the, the client team. Just maybe this is the most motivation part for my for my side. Yeah, from my side it's the same, like uh, knowing that you are working on a feature that is gonna be useful like so for so many users is uh, very good and very happy to work on that and especially like I can say to my friends like hey uh, this is the new feature that we introduced online and they would be very uh, amazed that we are doing such great things online so yeah I'm very happy to work online because of that. Thank you very much. Yes because you can it's a very happy to show those features to many users I agreed so we'd like to work together as well uh, in order to guarantee the user's safety. And I will be also involved in the development in such features. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>